I want to generate this ship in a similar fashion to how we created the captain himself. If you recall, when we were generating the bosun from last night, we were describing her ability to react as if the ship itself were alive. It had a personality. The sounds it made. Uh, the, the, I don't know, just the way it rocked and the way that it felt. And even how we were talking to, uh, Face of Jericho about driving a manual car. And how it becomes an extension of yourself when you drive a manual. When you sail, especially if you've been aboard a ship, uh, for a very long time, you know the creaks. You know the feeling of what it's like to be in different seas and different winds. If something's not right, you can see it, you can hear it, you can feel it, you can smell it. And if you're going to be having a ship-based campaign, the ship is a character itself. I mean, we come over to Unearthed Arcana, and, and this will back me up too. Take a look here. Right? The ship is a character itself. And so we are going to be generating the ship that our crew will be commanding. <laughs> because your ship is a crewmate. In fact, if you even want to take a bit of a supernatural bend, the ship may have a spirit that manifests. The ship may, you know, may have something along those lines. Well, it's a construct that uh, needed to have stats that can go down. Yeah, well, and, and, and so based on the scaling and the, the purpose of the stats that are in the Unearthed Arcana, we will be making it. Maybe not necessarily as a sentient construct or something like a shield guardian or the like. Uh, if you wish to, funny, but you may want to hang on to him because... Uh, you know, we're going to get a feel and we're going to develop a personality for the ship. We're going to roll a class for the ship as well. And and then based on that, a uh, gnome. We rolled a ra uh, we randomly rolled a gnome, Gareth. Uh here. Well, you say clearly a fighter, but you know what? We're going to leave this to the winds of chance. We we randomly rolled our officers. We made an NPC out of our captain, and now we're going to take the same we're going to take that same open approach and let's work with it to find out what kind of a ship this crew is is piloting. Yeah, funny, that's a very abbreviated version to Gareth, but I'm not going to tell you you're incorrect. <laughs> is there a story about a spirit of a ship i'm sure there are none none necessarily come to mind but you could have it be you know uh old wives tales sailor tales that kind of a thing where you know who knows maybe uh you know maybe the scrubbiest swab is the manifestation of the spirit of the ship and it judges you based on how you treat it Do I have a list of ship types? Yes, Gareth. Uh, in fact, here, I will... Um, so you can follow along at home, everybody. All right, so there's that. So let's take our template for an NPC and we're gonna reset it. And we are going to make our ship 
similar to how we made our NPC captain. That might be silly. Generating a ship like a character? I suppose you'll have to trust me and see where we go from here, funny. The worst case, if this is silly, then we've had fun. In the best case, maybe we're thinking about things in a different way and we can approach storytelling from a direction that we haven't before. You wanna write up a story about a captain that can't leave his ship for it's gone, uh, for it's gone, it's grown or gone far too attached to the captain. Write that story. You got it in you, funny. All right, back to chapter four. I hope you have your DMGs open, class. Come on, now you knew we were going to be doing this. Oh, Gareth. I, Codex Alera. I too have read the series. I know what you're talking about. Um, oh, and also in Magic, look at the weather light. Look at the weather light. A rowboat? Eh, probably not a rowboat. But we'll see. We'll see. Hang in there. <laughs> Do you know, by the way, you want to talk about silly ideas? Do you know how the Codex Alera series was written? It's one of your favorite. It's a really good one, and I would recommend it as well. It was recommended to me. I gave it a chance, and I really liked it. Do you know how that series came to be? Page 89. It's it's actually just right here. Underneath the uh, the photo, or the, not the photo, the, the picture. Gareth has it. Gareth, that is exactly, for any of you who don't know, Jim Butcher, he's not an unheard of author. Or, like, a not story. Maybe you haven't heard of him, but he is an, he's an accomplished author. This man wrote an awesome fantasy series because someone in an online forum challenged him to write a story about the lost Roman legion and Pokemon. And you say, what? That is crazy and dumb and silly. And you know what? You read that Codex Alara series and come back to me and Gareth. Gareth and me. And you let us know how that turned out. Yep, funny. You heard it right. Someone on an internet forum challenged him. Because he, he was like, yeah, you could write about anything. Someone said, fine. Write a story about the Lost Roman Legion and Pokemon. And he did. And six books later, it finishes the series. It's not like an ongoing. You're gonna you're gonna see thirty of these things. Five or six books later, and he has an awesome story to tell. Gareth, you are correct. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Name, we'll come up with a name and all that other stuff, so don't worry about that. Oh, you think it outdoes Dresden Files? Well, probably because Dresden Files is a genre in which we're really familiar. But Codex Alera, um, Codex Alera was really, it took these concepts that we know of in our world. Maybe not a lot of people have heard of the Lost Roman Legion. Um, but uh, it, it felt... More real, more original. <laughs> I haven't, Gareth. Um, it, it's not that I've been avoiding it. I just haven't read those yet. Uh, but if you're if if you recommend them, then I can I can queue them up. Because Cinder Spire is his kind of steampunk, right? 
like steampunk airship adventure. All right, occupation and history will build into this. I, I should probably, on our worksheet, move this for last. Oh, okay, yep, that, so that's the one you base all your airships off of. Excellent resource, then. And so thank you for throwing that out there for us to be aware. All right, our NPC appearance. What is going to be something that is going to be distinct about this ship? Each ship is going to have something that is going to help it stand out. Whether it came that way out of the shipyard or whether it was an aftermarket modification. What is going to help our ship to stand out amongst others? Let's uh, reset our rolls and roll a d20. 17. A distinctive nose. Now, a nose on a ship that could be a distinctive figurehead. Um, yeah, exactly. Funny. Uh, it could be. Um, it could be. A, a sail says Daniel. Well, it could be the uh, something about the mast uh, that that projects. Uh, I don't know all my nautical terms. Um. So yeah, it, it could be a mast uh, that uh, that projects up, or the or the forward mast that projects out. Gareth is saying a wheel. Uh, now, what do you mean by a wheel? Here we go, from the National Park Service, the parts of a ship. And look at this, we can even take a, a, a quiz at the end. But yeah, this part. Or it could be a figurehead along the bow here. Did I get that right? Yeah, the front of a vessel. But if you want to count a nose, perhaps if uh, if the ship is, in the, is, is uh, like a face... A nose could be sticking up as well. So it depends on how we want to look at it. But we know that our ship is going to have a distinctive nose. <laughs> Yard arms. The cross beams that come off the mast. Okay. Okay. Oh, the wheel that controls the rudder. So, uh, so perhaps the wheel of the ship is at the is at the front, at the bow. That would be very interesting. So, all right, bear, keep keep those in mind for all of you who are suggesting this. Let's we'll develop the the per, the ship step by step, and so let's keep these options in mind, and then we'll solidify, we'll solidify the ship from there. All right, the abilities. Now, unless we're going to make this an awakened ship uh, as per, like, a magic item, really, we're just going to be rolling for the three stats, uh, the physical stats, uh, for uh, strength, dex, and con. So let's roll uh, 2d6, 1 and 2, uh, strength, 3 and 4 dex, 5 and 6 con. A mimic? I have seen that statted. A mimic ship? Two 
two and two. All right, well, so it can't have strength being both, so we'll take strength is high, and low is going to be... Ahem. Low is going to be... Ahem. Low is... There we go. <laughs> low is going to be... Uh, dex. Yes, the helm is normally at the rear, so it's closer to the rudder. So if it was, um, if it was uh, at the bow, I mean, you'd have to have uh, some sort of uh, maybe a more intricate way of guiding uh, or of, of you know tugging on the rudder. All right, what is a particular talent our ship has? Let's roll a d20 and find out. All right, Gareth, yep. Keep it in your noggin, and you can throw it out there when, when you think it's an appropriate time to do so. 20. It knows thieves can't. Interesting. So if the ship knows thieves can't, the, I mean, the, it, whether it's the ship or not, perhaps Thieves' Cant is somehow, um, is somehow carved into or represented on the ship somewhere. Yeah, th there could be markings. Yeah, so it, it maybe maybe it's not thieves can't so like any like a city thief can go aboard, but we could even we could change this to be uh, sailors can't or the special like some special pigged in language of the sailors of this ship, and so if someone were to take the ship, especially if it does have some custom rigging, they would have a hard time managing the ship because the instructions um, are in this secret language. And the ship is built around this kind of methodology. Turn the thieves can on its head. The ship is known among thieves. So the, the ship's name is perhaps even entered into the uh, the lexicon of thieves can't. For, uh, being infamous, uh, famous or infamous for one thing or another. Notorious. It's mannerism. How will players... How does this ship roll, react, operate in a way that will be memorable so it's not just a sailing ship with sails and or oars or whatever? Pardon me. We rolled a four. Oh, wow. Wow. It also slurs its words, lisps, or stutters. Just like the captain, huh? Hmm. Hmm. Although, of course, what would a what would a stuttering ship, uh, what would a stuttering ship sound like? Would it be extra creaky? Uh, would it have, um, or if it slurs, is there? A, does it sound like there's a particular drag somewhere? Maybe it lists instead of lisps. Uh, maybe it lists. I like that too. Uh, I mean, why uh, you hear creaks in odd ways? Yeah, it could have a very distinct uh, creaking to it. Gareth says, oh, "Oh, I know something for that." Well, out with it, Gareth. Come on, don't hold back. Are the sails somehow custom that it sounds like um, it's whispering things in the wind? It's built to kedge, which causes it to turn extremely fast for broadside cannons. Sounds like a door knocking. Or it would sound like a whale call if it's kind of creaking in the, in the waves.
to warp or pull a ship along by hauling on the cable of an anchor carried out from the ship and dropped. <laughs> Middle English Kagan to fasten. Kegging is dropping the anchor while at full sail, using the anchor to pivot. And so if it does that, it probably makes a very unique sound. You could have reeds or resonators in the mast so you can sense the wind by sounds. Ooh, I like that as well. Maybe there's a weird whistle in the ship that can be heard in it. You all are onto something here. Reads in the mast help indicate wind direction and strength. When the ship kedges, it gives off uh, it gives off a a roaring groan. I guess it's a roar. Right? It's going to turn. And so, like, the ship itself sounds angry and it's, uh, it's turning. You know, it's, uh, it, it pulled the e-brake and, and we're, we're, we're Tokyo Bay drifting around the ocean here. It would shudder and groan. Yeah, Gareth. And so it would sound really, really angry. Like, you know, the, the bull that is, you know, getting ready to charge. Interactions with others. So, <laughs> how does this ship interact with the crew, or maybe those uh, out, outside of the crew, who might threaten it? We rolled 12. It's a suspicious ship. How would we describe a ship being suspicious? Uh, perhaps it doesn't handle very like very crisply. Maybe that's why we have to kedge. We have to force it to really make a turn. Um, you know, maybe so the the handling, you know, the the gears or the ropes and pulleys and chains going from the wheel to the rudder um, might be slow to react, or the because of the the customization, the the sails might um, I don't know sails might do something. New sailors have bad luck, so the ship is suspicious because of if it gets new crew members. Hey, Tracy. Crew members feel that someone's watching them when they do activities. Ooh. So perhaps there's carvings or something on the ship that look like, um, that look like, uh, what, like Nereid? Uh, or Sea Hags? Or... Um, or just mermaids or other other carvings so that they do look uh, So maybe the ship does look like it's looking after the crew in some way like wooden gargoyles and the like uh, Garrett says brings up my idea right now make the figurehead a war drum hearing that on the open sea in a bank of fog A maiden or angel eyeballs or some rendition of a creature suspicious so uh faces gargoyles etc adorn the ship making it seem like it is uh looking at the crew uh horizon etc i used etc twice but what are you gonna do about it you gonna stop me you can't stop me. <laughs> I'm far too powerful. Is the ship alive? Mm, maybe? So the distinctive nose could be something like um, the war drum. Or it could be, and or it could be one of those figures. I mean, you can combine the two, right? You have a very nice, 
you have a very nice maiden sculpture at the front and we combine it with a drum and there was a scene about that in wild wild west with will smith i'm just gonna leave it at that <laughs> Useful knowledge, uh, okay, question mark? What is the ship's ideal? Let's roll 2d6 and find out. Six and three. It's an other other ideal, and number three is glory. This ship was built for glory, my friends. That is the ideal of this ship. And now for its bond. Ten. Well, I'm going to roll a ten-sided die. Six. Ooh. It is drawn to a special place. Built by a... Uh, built by a long... Sto what? Built by a long? Stolen by a thief? Sold to a pirate, captured by the current captain. Oh, built by a king. So that yeah, the ship is seemingly built for glory, and it's so. Where is it drawn? Right. So if we have this history, that's built into it. You know, especially if it was uh, you know if it was stolen by a thief or whatever. Maybe that's who installed the uh, the special riggings, uh, the special uh, instructions, some customizations uh, to make sure that you know only the thief's crew. Uh, could have used it. You know, pirates got it. Maybe they only had it for a little bit before the current captain uh, obtained it. Where is this ship drawn? You know, is it made of a special wood that uh, that it must always return to this port in order to get replacement planks? Um, whether it's a practical matter? Is there a, a, even a slightly supernatural draw? For some reason, um, for some reason, does the ship act like a compass you know maybe there's a big old lodestone you know we, we say that it has a, uh, a distinctive nose is there a really big lodestone on the front and the ship just in a still sea can always find north you know so there's a practical or a, a quasi supernatural aspect to it Just the north, no matter how far north you sail, it always wants to continue north. I would feel it's made by ash and oak that makes it lead lead to its creation. So what do you what do you mean by that funny? Like, like can you draw out that idea a little bit more? So it's drawn to a special place. It's drawn to the north for some reason. It always seems to you know, if you're if so if you're if you're tacking into into uh, the north. It's nice and easy going. It might even feels like it always moves more quickly to the north. But if you ever steer away, it starts providing you a little bit of resistance. Maybe it even groans a little bit, right? It makes an odd noise. Maybe it groans a little bit whenever you're sailing south. It kind of mumbles. It's kind of a grumpy ship. Maybe it leads to its first captain's grave. I think it should get blown off course in storms that always seem to find or that send it to the same place. Oh, so it's not necessarily the ship itself, but perhaps circumstances that continually surround the ship. Drawn to a special place. Um, so storms always seem to have it settle in around the same place ash and oak is given resemblance of death and rebirth so it would have a quasi sense of its creation or rebirth in that case then is it not painted like it does it just have a finish or something 
I mean, besides, like, you know, uh, any caulking or tarring or, uh, or the like. Now. Oh, no, th that's fine, funny. Hey, this is where we're, th this is an idea area. Throw out ideas, throw out inspiration, right? We're, we're coming up with prompts, and let's link them all together. What is this ship's flaw or secret? D12? We rolled a one. Forbidden love or susceptibility to romance. All right, let's interpret this. Whoops. Let's interpret this. How would this be a flaw in a ship? Does it have um, does it have a companion uh, a companionship out there? Is it uh, is it one of two two ships like this have been made? In that case, do, do storms always seem to bring this second ship to this place? Uh, does it uh, susceptibility to romance? Does it, um, is it very attractive to others so that the ship is really always sort of being passed on or passed down? Because people want this ship uh, because of its legend, its capabilities. Um, so others seem to fall in love with it very easily. It loves rough oceans. It, it's always drawn to the eye of the storm. God forbids it gets drawn towards a whirlpool. It already has something like this with its past owners. about fluffy are you talking about the it's drawn to a special place or are you talking about a ship uh being able to i guess seduce others or that there's like a, a sister ship out there that is you know th that they're bonded like twins or something hey diadems welcome Oh, well, I mean, yeah, so like the AI of the ship, the computer, uh, grew feelings. That's true. Oh, no, DMs. Did the donuts... Are, are the donuts no longer with us? Oh, what happened if you're willing to share, DMs? Nicer. How about it's forbidden love? Is that of the land and it's drawn or can slow when land is ahead? Hmm. Hmm. So the ship has curves in all the right places. And a lot of people are pursuing it and are seemingly after it. Probably even jealous of whoever the, ca the current captain is. Uh, so the ship's... Aesthetics and performance make it highly desirable. Whoops. As such, it is constantly spoken about, pursued, and even captured or conquered. The ship also seems to give preference to certain people, allowing them to steer it with more ease. How about that? So it'll work. I mean, if, if someone's at the helm, it'll still turn, it'll still groan, and it'll still do this. But maybe the ship somehow has a love of a crewmate or two. You know, so it, it could be the captain in this case. Uh, and so the ship almost chooses the captain in this regard because the ship will be more cooperative if the captain's at the helm. Or, I don't know, let's say that um, 
the ship loves the cook and the captain. Or not even the captain, for some reason. The captain, I guess, is more of the figurehead. <laughs> and it's the first mate. And the cook. And so if either of them are at the helm, it'll... Oh, it, it's smooth sailing and everything's wonderful. But you could have, you know, an old sea salt who's been navigating waters for, you know, 40 years. Um, who should be able to pilot this thing. Gets behind the wheel. And the ship creaks and it groans and it seems to fight against uh, being handled by a person like this. Which could also mean that that's why it switches hands. If it doesn't like who's uh, who's piloting it, right? It wants glory. And if someone can't offer it glory, maybe it's going to reject that uh, that person. And as such, I mean, that love, you know, forbidden or otherwise, that love can turn into violence. You know, that love could have turned into blood spilled on the deck. I couldn't go through with the TPK, so I had some divine intervention, and basically the party was wiped out. Oh, the a uh, whale, the banshee. Yeah, those those are rough, especially in third edition diadems. It's the Elder Wand ship, says Fluffy. The ship is a flighty maiden. It uh, its love changes. The quartermaster, the one that always directs repairs. Uh, well, in that case, it'd be. Um, oh, actually, I think they had that be the Bozen in the Unearthed Arcana. Uh, if we come down here. Let me double check. Uh, Quartermaster plots the ship's course relying on knowledge of nautical charts and a study of the weather. Uh, high wisdom score. Bozen uh, provides technical advice to the captain and crew and leads repair and maintenance efforts. And the way that we developed this Bozen, this, this ship would probably love our Bozen. Because she is this barbarian who's very much in touch, uh, like is very aware of, uh, of sound and is, is alert by the feet. And it is really kind of one with the ship. Quartermaster and first mate were kind of backwards, but the bosun seems right. Funny says maybe it's that it needs a person who can give uh, who can give the fight it wants. And so yeah, in this case, uh, it might accept the captain because the captain will give this ship the fight it's looking for. But it may not accept the, the captain, um, or it might be neutral towards the captain. Maybe it won't fight against the captain, but it won't be the same as if the bosun were behind the wheel, right? So they're, they're more like allies, whereas the ship would be more like a lover to another one of the officers. <laughs> you hope the bosun's is named Higgs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Now, funny, you are kind of two steps ahead of where we're going to be going here. Because this week we've made the crew that the Unearthed Arcana talk about. Next week, we're going to be introducing a couple other characters that could be someone like a, a sergeant at arms or a gunner as well as a couple other roles and for various reasons that i i will get into because ultimately i want to explore this unearthed arcana and i want to have some inspiration how can we make a campaign around this but also kind of you know lifting my my skirt up above my ankle here oh my this is an idea i'm throwing out because i may do something with this on the channel in the future where we can have extra play time together outside of just Tuesdays. So we'll see. No, don't apologize, Funny. You are absolutely correct. D don't apologize for that. You are, you're thinking, you're on it, and in, I think you're picking up what we're, what we're building towards. We just gotta take it one step at a time. <laughs> Got some good news from my end? And yes, hi, memory lapse. I'm sorry, I was on my soapbox again. Uh, here soon I'll be running a game of Tomb of Horrors for Technotron. Oh, nice. Oh, Techn I bet you'll have a lot of fun with him. He's creative. He's really laid back. Technotron is an awesome dude. Uh, but the bosun is, uh, here, we'll go back here. Uh, this was the bosun that we ended up making. A female mountain dwarf berserker barbarian 
uh, who is a gladiator, uh, who is good at uh, acting, jesting, and is a singer. Uh, we gave her a nice big maul to help repairs with the ship, and uh, she rolled five feats instead of stat bumps. So we gave her tough, and by the way, check out those hit points. 233 hit points. Tavern Brawler, Athlete, Alert, and Great Weapon Master. Her passive perception uh, was, uh, or I'm sorry, that, that was with the other one. Her initiative is seven, and with her barbarian reflexes, she can react to breaks in the ship even before it's fully broken. So as, as we're developing her, she's very much in tune, right? Barbarians have this trap sense, this kind of wild sense. They can react to things. And so we're using her barbarian instincts as the as the, the head, like, carpenter of the ship in order to be able to dash around quickly, uh, wield a variety of tools, including large sledges, to help kind of pound planks back into place. And we gave her smithing tool proficiency as a dwarf so she can make nails, she can make other parts for the ship uh, herself that are needed. Which can really be effective too if the ship needs a lot of custom parts. Next dungeon, I can't guarantee the party would survive a TPK. Well, uh, hey, if they've, uh, if they've, you've warned them, right? You're like, hey, this is out there. You got to be careful. Use some strategy. The wind chimes on the boat rings with a kind, uh, with a song of the Valkyrie. So, like the reeds in the in the mast, kind of what uh, Fluffy was talking about. Was thinking if the group works well together and if they want to afterwards, I'll run Dragon Heist and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Oh, I'm sure you'll make a lot of you'll make all those people happy. Memory lapse, and I hope that you'll that you're happy too, running for other folks. This is inspiring me to make a proper sailor class and not just a background, huh? Well, Gareth, if you want to do it, share it with us and maybe we can use it on our stream if you're willing to, to do so. Funny, we all hope that we, we can do so. And you know what? Sometimes, sometimes you just don't have the best game. And that's fine. Heck, on Tuesdays, there's been a couple times where I'm like, I don't know. I don't know about that session. I don't think that was motivating or it didn't feel compelling or powerful or interesting it's fine to have those doubts and i've certainly had it in other games not just the, the tuesday one we broadcast you know we hope for it we strive for it we try and be better and always present something fun and compelling and you know what sometimes it doesn't happen and sometimes a pc in your game might just not be having a good day and and it happens, but that's the, the the wonderful social aspect to this game, because we're all still here for each other, and even if the person uh, is having an off day, we can still step up and make up for it in other ways. Coffee Cat, you've enjoyed every session on Tuesdays? Well, don't spoil me, Coffee Cat. Come on now, I can't get lazy. You just had to draw me back into my nautical addiction. Gareth... <laughs> Good. Good. I mean, Tihi? What? Oh, speaking of Tuesday, yeah, we don't need that right now. Oh, well, thank you, funny. Pneumonica, I have those kinds of doubts roughly twice per game I run, one during and one afterwards. Sometimes it's three times with one before. No, those were not spoilers, Funny. Uh, the, it was a reference page that my players have. I mean, you, if you want to clip it for spoilers, sure, you can do so. <laughs> but it's... Uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> this is nothing that my players don't already have. <laughs> to be fair, Fluffy, uh, several anonymous party members have been contacting me about this, that, or even the other. 
uh, in order to pursue this side role play and to obtain knowledge um, and to maybe piece together clues that they can bring to the table in the proper role play. Um, you know, whether it's heads up on Tuesday or it's in your side RP conversation. Now, I, I will say, while my players have this same document, there's probably things in the document that if they knew about it would probably be spoilers. Because I am devious and I do this sort of thing. I mean, maybe not spoilers for the whole darn thing where if you do fit on the chance you figure it out, I, it would ruin the game for you. I wouldn't do that. But I, I will call them Easter eggs. There's probably fun Easter eggs inside that document somewhere. All right, so we have our ship, right? High strength, low dex. Uh, we've given it a personality. We've given it a history. Right, so this isn't this isn't a ship virgin to the sea. You know, this is its first voyage. It's been around, right? It has these, it, and it has drawbacks too. I'm invested. Well, coffee. It's in front of you. I'm trying not to, you know, do a machinations that last, you know, that span lifetimes kind of uh, story setup, but there's a lot there. You know that this takes place in Mesotopia and that there are characters you met specifically from that campaign called the Mesomasca Raid. And so it would... You could think that perhaps there are elements from Mesotopia as we've generated it or specifically about uh, the week we spent making Mesomasca, uh, the, pl uh, the characters in the campaign, that could be invoked by you or by me or that have come up or have not yet come up but it's out there it's been on youtube for months and months it's been uh it's accessible anyway so getting back to this ship we have we have some some basics now right we have an idea of of this ship and its personality and aspects of it that can be true regardless of the, the the style of ship that we have. And by the way, Gareth, I should take some pictures of some artwork I have because I have a lot of nautical stuff around the home. Um, I think you'd really like it. Uh, now we need the name. Almost. Almost funny. I still want to come up here and go through a, a character generating process. Hey, if you want to avoid it, that's fine, Coffee. I'm not. I'm not going to necessarily reward or punish uh, any of you that that are familiar with other aspects of Mesotopia or the Mesomasca raid campaign itself. So yeah, I'm. I'm. What you're. What I'm giving you for Tuesday is relevant to Tuesday. If you did have a, other knowledge, it might not even be relevant. But if you consider it meta, I totally understand. Uh, but the campaign isn't riding on you going through and dissecting every little aspect of the characters and all that other stuff. Nope, that, that's fine. Especially if you know that you know yourself, Coffee, that you have this tendency, you're doing the right thing. All right, let's go back. Well, almost. You know what? We're going to bring up... We're going to bring up the uh, the guide here. And like we did with the captain, we don't need to make a complete sheet out of it. But let's get some details about the ship. Is our ship going to be um, a male name or a female name? We rolled a 67. So it may be male or more masculine in appearance, um, or something along those lines. I mean, how, how do we describe a ship as being male? Again, it could just be the name of the ship, or it could be uh, imagery. It could be a, a lot of different things. You know, you could name it the Edmund Fitzgerald. How about that? 
Because there is a legend passed down, or a legend lives on from the Chippewa on down about the great lake they call Gichigumi. The lake, it is said, never gives up its dead when the gales of November go blowing. Okay, yeah, I mean, it could be neutral. Uh, and again, So, male, uh, not that there's a compelling nature to give it uh, to give it a distinction, but these are just points of consideration, tiebreakers. Uh, just we're throwing stuff out there, and and we're gonna, and and we're gonna make a magic eye, and we're gonna look at it, and we're gonna we're gonna look at the magic eye and see if there's a, a ship. It's not a ship; it's a schooner. A schooner is a ship. Eh, mall rats, anyone? Mall rats? Anyway, might have something to do with the figure in the bow, whether it's a woman, a man, some weird horror of the deep, all of which happened historically. Yeah, hey, yeah, we could have a we could have a strong, uh, yeah, we could have a powerful my. Like, uh, Neptune-style, you know, prow. Um, you know, or, uh, in, instead of a mermaid, you know, uh, we have a merman. Fluffy, oh, tell me what were their names. Tell me what were their names. Did you have a friend on the good Reuben James? That's the most Midwest song I've ever heard on stream. <laughs> well, I am in Ohio. I'm not on Gitchigumi. Uh, I'm on Lake Erie, but, uh, <laughs> Gareth. I mean, look, we all need a little Gordon Lightfoot, right? You know, uh, you know, the, the Keys, the Caribbean, uh, has their own, uh, master, uh, master storyteller and cultural songwriter about, uh, about, you know, Southern Caribbean sea navigation and nautical stuff and, and life on the islands. And we in the Midwest, we need our Gordon Lightfoot. Yeah, it was showing there, how huh, fluffy. I have a picture of the Edmund Fitzgerald, uh, a portrait actually painted by. Um, oh my God, why am I derping on his name? Um, Kincaid. I don't have a picture of it immediately on stream, but maybe I can find it. There's a lot of paintings about the Edmund Fitzgerald because there's a sister painting of the Titanic, and I have that as well. Um, it's not. Is it Kincaid? No, it's. Uh, ah, I'm gonna have to go and take a look. It's bothering me that I don't have it on the tip of my tongue. Ah, funny says, remember kids uh, for the Great Lakes, always think of homes. Yes, I am south. I am, I am, I am north central Ohio right on the lake. Like exactly between Cleveland and Toledo. Like I, I cannot get more north nor more central in the state. Oh yeah, yeah, not too far away. Toledo's just an hour away. We actually have a, uh, a nautical museum here in Sandusky. I oh, I should go to it, and I should take pictures. It's research, but also there could be some cool stuff I could I could share with you all. We have a maritime museum here in town. Shame on me for not going to it. We also have a merry-go-round museum, so that could be a lot of fun too. I think they're giving away free rides around Christmas. Oh, come on, we're we're kids at heart. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Um, what is the race of our ship? Now, this could be the, the ship builders, so the culture that produced it, or it could be the features. I mean, it, it could have been a human kingdom, but uh, they're building an elvish ship. Let's find out. One, dwarf. Evans, hill dwarf.
This ship doesn't ne necessarily have an alignment. I mean, aside from glory. Um, so I don't know. I mean, we could practice just to see. Maybe it could be inspiration. Why not? What are we at? We're at a, a couple of electrons. 80, 82. Ooh, it's not evil. Uh, but it is a, a chaotic neutral. If we want to include this information. Level, eh, not worried about that. What is the background of the ship? Was it a criminal? 10. A sage. Oh my gosh, just like the captain, huh? Remember, they also, uh, they also slur. <laughs> they, they're bonded, right? The ship chose the captain. The captain chose the ship. Finkel is Einhorn. Einhorn is Finkel. Whatever number eight is. Now, what is the class personality of the ship? Let's find out. D12. Three. A cleric. And a cleric of... Two. A cleric of life. And, uh, well, let's see, it's a dwarven ship. I mean, parts can get replaced. Let's see how old this dwarven ship is. Let's roll a percentile. 82. Ooh, this is an old ship at that. So what is old for a dwarf? This is column 5. All right, so we're rolling a 75-sided die. All right, so uh, this is 75, 281 years old. Now, is all the wood still there from its original building? Probably not, but at least in spirit. You know, the parts have been passed on. The spirit of the ship has been passed on. And so this thing, this concept of a ship has been sailing for quite some time. It would be like our... Um, uh, if any of you are not from the U.S., uh, we actually have a, a sailing ship in our Navy, uh, the USS Constitution. In fact, I'll bring it up real quick. Or wait, was it? Is it the Constitution? Am I? Am I right? Uh, Navy sailing ship. Okay, yeah. Old Ironsides, wooden hauled, three-masted heavy frigate for the U.S. Uh, Navy. Named by President George Washington. Um, it's the world, yeah, it's the world's oldest commissioned naval vessel still afloat. So there we go. So this is, it's commissioned in our Navy. It is technically a, a naval vessel of our country. You want to talk about an old ship? This is not the original wood, of course, but in spirit, uh, in purpose, it has sailed all of these years. Uh, Gareth, I think we're going to have to pile the Nerdo crew in a car, and then we can ditch them to go to the Nautical Museum. <laughs> yeah, hey, you all can come and, and visit, right? And I'll give you, uh, I'll give uh, others things to do, and Gareth, you and I can go to the to the Maritime Museum uh, that's in town here. Uh, it's from a movie called Kung Fui. That's when the main character is kidnapped by a fat villain named One Ton. He tells he's going to teach the hero character a lesson he'll never forget and teaches him how to remember the names of the Great Lakes. <laughs> 
uh, the ship type, uh, brig, baroque, clipper, etc., uh, would be its race, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what what I'm doing is I'm rolling here, in D and D terms we know, and then we're going to extrapolate that into a, a ship type that is accessible to us in the Unearthed Arcana, Gareth. Memory, I'm next to the Pennsylvania border in New York, just north of Bradford. Yeah, so we're all close-ish. Some sh is longer than others. I mean... There is a handy dandy guide if any of you did want to visit. I mean, how far away is Ohio? Well, so not too far. Eh, a little ways or a ways. But here, if you're here, you're in Ohio. So welcome. Moo. That's right, cow. Uh, life domain cleric access to heavy armor and you know what uh, we can use uh, class aspects like that memory lapse uh, with consideration for the ship that we're making 260 years was close as funny if Theseus built it then definitely all wood has been replaced and it, it was the constitution the ship that was caught uh, within wait ah yes the ship that was caught within weeder bees savings and loans I don't know if I get that funny. And Trinity Tower. I've been up on that ship, says Gareth. Oh, you know, every summer we have something called the Festival of Sail, where we get uh, where we get uh, where we get sailing ships that come into town and dock, including like the world's largest rubber duck that comes by too. Nautical visit would be amazing. I was a sailor once upon a time, says Gareth. Uh, so Gareth is speaking from experience, and that is the best foundation for fantasy and I say that and I say that for this reason truth is stranger than fiction but it is because fiction is obliged to stick to possibilities truth isn't Gareth in all your time sailing I'm sure that you have encountered things that would prove Mark Twain absolutely correct. You just never would have suspected something like this. And yet there there you were, or there that was, or that happened, or whatever. I'm opening up all these tabs. My, my poor RAM has got to be burning up now. Because <laughs> I use Chrome. Heavy armor, more like HP and maybe resistance to kinds of damage. Master at Arms. Well, Gareth, uh, then your input into this project is is certainly... Not that... Look, just you don't need Navy experience for funny or anyone else. Uh, but if you want to contribute uh, some knowledge, some wisdom, uh, some experiences, you are welcome to do so in this creative process, Gareth. Okay, so here, this is what we're looking for. Let's go, oh, actually, you know what? Almost. We have a sage, correct? Let's pop back over real quick. Sage number eight. Th this is the spirit of the ship, right? Scribe. Oh. Oh, right? We have all these, all the, all, all this like sailor's cant or thieves cant or whatever inscribed all around it. As a scribe, what if there's all kinds of... I mean, what if there's almost like a secret carved into everything? There's words, there's coordinates. Like, this ship has just accumulated knowledge over the years. For a little bit of the supernatural, what if no one ever recalls carving into the ship? Like, everyone just knows, yeah, the ship has all sorts of carvings. But every time something new happens, maybe the ship carves itself a little bit. Very subtly. Like, no one would really know, especially after all this time. But the ship might have started out with, you know, being very smooth. But as it has gained experience, it is written or drawn or something 
Uh, it's invented a nautical emoji <laughs> uh, that is slowly uh, being ingrained or, you know, um, uh, scrimshawed, I don't have vocabulary, into the wood. Yeah, Gareth has 281 years of history and, and glory, apparently, carved into the ship. Oh, yeah, Funny Dale, Battle Glory. Now, we're going to keep the other parts of the background, the personality of the ideal bond and flaw, because it is a ship, it's an NPC, and we're going to stick with this. Let's look at the personality. As a scribe, what, um, how might it convey itself? Five and six. Number five. I'm willing to listen to every side of an argument before I make my own judgments. Okay. And number six. I speak slowly when talking to idiots. Comma. Ellipses. Which almost everyone is compared to me. Wounds heal, but experience never fades. Mannerisms is part of its history. Slurs, lisps, and shudders carved into it. it <laughs> Memory, are you saying that sailors might drink and might slur or have other speech impediments? Sir. <laughs> you just know that like scrawled somewhere on the head of the ship and the head of the ship is the toilet and it's at the head of the ship because remember you want the wind blowing into your sails to push you forward right so if your if your bathroom was at the back of the ship it's gonna blow the smell forward across the entire thing so you want the head at the bow at the front so that the wind blows it ahead of the ship and you spare your your shipmates uh that so you could probably imagine you know for a good time call you know it's kind of scrawled in there <laughs> for a good time cast the message spell at <laughs> the detailed description <laughs> Oh, I bet there are swears and oaths and curses of all languages that can be found. In fact, it, they even might manifest in certain rooms. You know, there might even be it's it's called it's called the swear uh, the swear jar or something or like the the swear brig or whatever. <laughs> hey, whoa! I'm kind of literate sometimes, occasionally. See, that's a lot of polysyllabic words, Gareth. <laughs> All right, so the ship might listen, right? And especially if it wants to grant uh, uh, love or favor or grow to know someone, um, it might listen. You know, the captain's plan, but the you know, but the first mate says, "Captain, we can't do that. It's too dangerous." And the ship might kind of list in one side or the other after listening to the argument back and forth. And so you say, "There we go. The ship made up its mind." And I speak slowly, so heck. Again, quasi-supernatural. Every once in a while, look. Maybe the ship almost seems to say things. What if the ship is, sen is uh, sentient? I would, I would put this out there in memory. As a DM, give hints that it could be, but never confirm nor deny that it is. Just like we're talking about the missing ring finger of the captain, let let conjecture happen. Let conjecture take place and have fun with it and see where it goes. The ship may very well be sentient, but you'll never tell your players that. You can. I don't think you should. We have heavily implied it is, Gareth, which means that our job is done. 
we've given heavy implication that this ship has somehow gained a, a spirit, sentience, an intelligence, something along those lines. I mean, I could argue that if we want to roll for um, if we want to roll for a uh, a mental score of some kind, or as as DMs, we could actually stat it out as an intelligent artifact ship. But I think in the sake of storytelling, it could be fun to always hint at it, but never actually reveal if the ship is sentient or not. It's just too juicy of a roleplay factor to let go. A possible sentient ship that never confirms nor denies whether it is. I mean, memory, if, a, if you ask the ship, are you sentient, and it said no... It therefore confirms that it is. <laughs> Although, you know what? Players can try and trick you into that. Understands all languages, speaks none. Gareth's got it. Ship might also, when in danger, would move uh, its debris or broken mass against the wind. Since you're old cleric, I think the ship doesn't have to be sentient. It just serves as sort of a link to a god. Yeah, it, so it could be the like a chess piece of a, of a god. You know, pushing influence around where it's needed you know that this ship is the finger of god or something like that but what if it doesn't answer when asked the question of it's sentient then it clearly is sentient because it's just taking its time to think and to troll you so in in any all results point to it is obviously clearly 100 percent sentient even if it's not it is <laughs> Okay, let's go here, and uh, let's look at the ships that are available. I think, based on what we're talking about, we don't have a rowboat, especially because it has a low dex. So, there are several broad categories of ship that Unearthed Arcana offers us. We're looking for a ship that is going to have a high strength, but a low dex. And something that is going to fit this life cleric, which which it was pointed out, life clerics can wear heavy armor. It's so like a high AC or a high damage threshold. What if it only talks to the captain? Well, whoops. It was heavily implied that uh, the ship chooses a lover. In some way. A, a paramour. Someone that it chooses because it wants to be captain. Of course, a lot of people want this ship for other reasons. But the ship may also want someone in particular. Slow-mo, I don't think you're saying too soon for the Titanic. I, I think I think that ship has sailed. Almost funny. What, our last thing that I want to do, I want to go over the ships. And let's choose one based on what we've generated for the concept of the ship. Yeah, I know. It's a really good camera, too. And it, it's my fault because it's not even tape. It's because the the wire or the, the cord, the USB, uh, is drooping. And as I, I shifted my leg. Okay. So, we have an airship, uh, 20 crew, 10 passenger, 80 by 20, uh, you know, medium strength, medium dex, eh. And then new Monica, well, I'll take that as a compliment from you. AC of 13, eh. I don't think an airship is what we're going for here. Now, now we have a galley. A galley, 130 feet by 20, 80 crew, 40 passengers. Big decks, or a uh, big strength. 24 strength, 4 decks. That seems to fit things. Uh, armor class 15, and it can take 500, it has 500 hit points with a damage threshold of 20. That could very well reflect uh, heavy armor or being a life cleric, you know, it's sort of like restoring your hit points and the like. So a galley may work. Um, although, uh, let's see. Sails and oars. It has four ballista, or ballista if you want, or ballistas, and two mangonels. 
And uh, here, I'll consume more RAM. There you go. And it does have a RAM. Now, we did say that this ship has a funny nose. Could that RAM be the finger of God? Boop. Goes around booping other boats. So this could work. It might, Shlomo. We're we're shopping. We're we're in the we're in the shipyard, and we're looking at ships that are matching the sh uh, the the one that we've generated. Oh wait, oh wait, our sh our sheep, not a ship. Our sheep got a ramp. Well, in that case, we're gonna have uh, we'll have uh, we'll have little little babu sheep. <laughs> Keelboat, nah, that's going to be a little bit too small, right? Small strength, eh, it fits that otherwise. Um, but I don't think a keelboat's really going to uh, is really going to do it for what we're what we're doing here. Now a long ship, right? It's Twenty strength, six decks does seem to fit. AC fifteen, three hundred hit points, a slightly lower th uh, damage threshold. Sails and oars. But the longship doesn't have any any weapons. Now a cleric, I mean a, a cleric does have uh, spells, and you know we could we could uh, manifest that as a ballista or the like. Um, but I don't know. Maybe a longship isn't going to be what we're looking for. A rowboat, I think we can pass that. <laughs> a regular sailing ship, well, ballista and a mangonel, eighty by twenty, yeah, kind of average here. 15 damage uh, threshold. Mm. Or a warship, which, uh, Gareth, if that's what you were implying by saying heavy frigate. Because if we want to get into species of boats or ships, there are all manner of, of types. Upgrade those to a trebuchet. Cleric spells don't scream weapons to me, and yes, I know they can. Guiding bolt can be the cannon. Yeah, so um, we could we could manifest that, or maybe it just actually can. It has some sort of a magic projectile weapon, like a, a like like a cannon. You know, it can harvest divine energy of some kind. You know, it's a life cleric. It's not light. That'd be ooh, that'd be like those Roman uh, the, the ships that had uh, what Roman fire or Greek fire. Right, it would kind of go up to another ship, and and they they'd have like a like a flaming tar, or it'd be almost like a, a flamethrower effect. Uh, warship, uh, so forty crew, sixty passengers, um, armor class fifteen. We have five hundred there. Helm, sails, and oars. Two ballistas and two mangonels, and it does have a ram. So a warship. Mm, if we had a war cleric, I think for sure. But I wonder if the uh, I wonder if the not the airship. The galley. Actually, what's the big difference? One thirty by twenty, hundred and fifty tons. 24 strength. A warship only has 20 strength. Interesting. I mean, it still fit that. Same AC. It's 15, 520. 15, 520. Helm sails oars. 16, 12, 12. Eighteen, twelve, twelve. So the helm is a little bit more protected. Two mangonel and two ballista, but the galley has uh, four and two. 
The warship? Uh, maybe the warship would be more appropriate. And it also has a ram. I don't know. What do you all think, then? So we've gone over the species that are available. What what style of ship here is, is coming across as this uh, cleric? Remember, heavy armor, uh, simple weapons, and a shield. Um... What is what what is really coming across to you? Hey, Pocket Punch, welcome. Great to see you back. Galley needs a lot of people. Five times out of a warship. The warship fits well, thanks, Gareth. Ram makes more sense on a galley. Well, so I mean, the warship here does have a ram built into it, but even if it didn't. A, an NPC appearance, it has a distinctive nose. So our NPC ship might still have had a... Even if it was an airship, we could have given it a ram. I think because we rolled this distinctive nose and we want something that does make it stand out in some way. There are also oars. Right? Uh, here we go. Oars. And of course, that's without like Qual's feather uh, fan or anything along those lines. But uh, but for the ram also, uh, this is saving throws when relating to crashing, when it crashes into a creature or object. So it, it doesn't always just have to be offensive. You know, if it has a ram, it might help deflect off of uh, a cliff face or something, or it might even just help deflect off of another boat. Think like the cow catchers on on trains, right? And you can, uh, and, and and this is saying too. It can also it gives you the saving throw, so you can use it as a deflector. Not like a deflector dish on the Enterprise, but wouldn't that be cool? The ship classes are kind of random, so I I, I don't know how they went about distilling. Well, who are the six major officers, and and how are we distilling? You know, the different frigates or galleys or junks or uh, you know battleships or carriers. I mean, these are more modern, but. Um, uh, what schooners and uh, and the like? Yeah, I I, they're, I think they're just trying to distill things in some kind of, some kind of a general sense. So I, with that, I, you know, if if you Fluffy or Gareth, if you have a recommendation, if we're going to choose this as our generic stat block, I mean, we're calling it warship. Obviously, we could make it look Oriental. We could make it look Occidental. Um, I, well, we, we can flavor it to look, I mean, we can flavor it to look dwarven. And what does that look like? What, what is a dwarf's concept of an open sea sailing vessel? Could be interesting, huh? So with this in mind, Gareth, Fluffy, or anyone else out there, Shlomo, uh, Pocket Punch, Memory Lapse, using this as a general guideline... Is there a particular style of ship, whether it's a named vessel from history or it's just a category of ship that we could reference for our for our NPC ship here? I'm going to put warship stats low and squat, which uh, lends to warship. I'm going to stick to my guns on the frigates. Uh, so sure, let's take a look at a heavy frigate. A frigate is a type of warship having various sizes and roles over the last few centuries. In the 17th, a frigate was any warship built for speed and maneuverability. The description often used was, a fr was being frigate built. These could be warships carrying their principal batteries of carriage-mounted guns on a single deck or on two decks. The term was generally used for ships too small to stand in the line of battle, although early line-of-battle ships were frequently referred to as frigates when they were built for speed. 
for, uh, let's see, 18th century frigates were usually as long as a ship of the line and were square rigged on all three masts or full rigged, but were faster and with lighter armament used for patrolling and escort. The definition adopted by the British Admiralty, they were, re they were rated ships of at least 28 guns, carrying their principal armaments upon a single continuous deck, the upper deck, while ships of the line possessed two or more continuous decks. Uh, 19th century, beginning 1858, with the construction of prototypes by the British and French navies, the armored frigate was a type of ironclad warship uh, that for a time was the most powerful type of vessel afloat. The term frigate was used because such ships still mounted their principal armaments on a single continuous upper deck. Monica says that style of frigate seems late for many D&D games, which are more medieval. Nikki, welcome. We're we're talking ships. We're ship talking. <laughs> to keep it PG thirteen. Generally, frigates first appeared in the seventeenth century. I mean, so I mean, D and D is, you know, um, it it's an, an anachronism itself. But eh, cheek is a galleon. It's strong and slow. Yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're shooting the ship. Oh, the Constitution brings uh, brings it up. <laughs> Heavy frigates. In 1797, three of the U.S. Navy's first six major ships were rated as 44-gun frigates, or super frigates, which operationally carried 56 to 60 24-pounder long guns. Uh, ships were so well armed they were often regarded as equal to ships of the line and after a series of losses at the outbreak of the War of 1812 uh, hey, history in Lake Erie about that uh, Royal Navy fighting instructions ordered British frigates to never engage American frigates at any less than a 2 to 1 advantage USS Constitution preserved as a museum ship by the US Navy is the oldest commissioned warship afloat and is a surviving example of a frigate from the age of sail Constitution and her sister ships, President and United States, were created in a response to deal with the Barbary Coast Pirates and in conjunction with the Naval Act of 1794. The three big frigates, when built, had a distinctive building pattern which minimized hogging, in which the center of the keel rises while both ends drop. It improves hydrodynamic efficiency. The hull was designed so that all of the weight from the guns was upon the keel itself. All right, so if we're talking dwarves, I mean, it might be an anachronism, but having an iron-sided, right? A cleric can wear heavy armor, plate armor, and the like. A dwarven sailing vessel could be an iron side, even if it was a, a, a above its time or, you know, ahead of its time. Because, you know, who'd suspect the dwarves would have a naval vessel at all, let alone one that they got to float with, uh, you know, with uh, a metal hull or at least metal tacked onto it. I would suggest a hulk also called a Hulk, which uh, was used as medieval warships and seemed the correct size. We can check that out, too. Age of Steam, the Armored Frigate, World War II, and then, of course, we're getting into more modern ones here. This is a literal combat ship. <laughs> Interesting design. Didn't Korean turtle ships have metal on their hulls and were from the 16th? Meat Boy, hello, baby. I, I don't know, but uh, I'm willing to look into history. Right? This is why playing D&D &D opens you up to so much stuff. A uh, Hulk. Uh, nothing's really coming up for that, huh? I guess we'll look up just Hulk. Entertainment people, ships, Hulk, ship type, medieval ship type. Uh, 
A uh, type of medieval sea craft, a technological predecessor to the of the Carrick and the Caravel. Caravel. No, no picture for that. The Hulk appears to have remained a relatively minor type of sailing ship, apparently peculiar to the low countries of Europe, where it was probably used primarily as a river or canal boat with limited potential for coastal cruising. The only evidence of hulks that we have are from legal documents and iconography. Hey, TJ. The trick with metals at this time is that uh, redox reactions uh, weren't well understood, and therefore the idea of galvanizing or uh, sacrificial metals would be poorly understood. That could very well be. And you know what? The first uh, the first intonation of this ship could very well have suffered um, rust and other oxidization. You know, the dwarves might not very well have been, no uh, you know, they may know a lot about metal, but in their own ways. But uh, the ship, as we're finding it now, is 260 years old, did we roll? The Caravel was an exploring boat, so if this is a predecessor, this wouldn't fit well in, with a warship. And uh, funny, I do see your list that you, you provided up there. 281, that's right. So it could have had some upgrades over time. Caravel is a small, highly maneuverable sailing ship developed in the 15th century by the Portuguese to explore along the West African coast and into the Atlantic Ocean. The Latin sails gave it speed and the capacity for sailing windward or beating. Caravels were used by the Portuguese and Castilians for the oceanic exploration voyages during the 15th and 16th century in the Age of Discovery. Uh, Prince Henry, Vasco da Gama, Christopher Columbus, and Bartolomeu Diaz all used caravels. So if we find something, um, I mean, going with an early frigate could work. Uh, I mean, the caravel certainly, I think, is striking what we want. In fact, maybe the dwarves made this as an ex as an exploratory vessel that over time, again, it learned, it gained experience. It's this old. It has all these uh, etchings all over it. Um, you know, maybe it learned as well as the crew. You know how to put armor on and, and how to carry uh, and how to carry some weaponry. So uh, I don't know. Is there something between a caravel and a frigate? I mean, again, we could just go frigate if we want. <laughs> we could just say frigate. <laughs> but still, I mean, whether or not we use something. In fact, uh, we can even try and look up um, the uh, the turtle boat. Here we go. Turtle ship, also known as a Geo Buxian, was a type of large Korean warship that used intermittently by the Royal Korean Navy during the Joseon Dynasty from the early 15th century until the 19th. Participated in the war against Japanese naval forces. Um, da -da -da -da. Metal spikes were used to cover the top of the turtle ship to deter boarding tactics. Ooh, that's cool. Used by the Japanese. According to historical records, the spikes were covered with empty rice sacks or rice mats to lure the Japanese into trying to board, since the boarding would appear safe. However, modern authors have found this to be unlikely, since such an arrangement would have invited enemy fire uh, uh, enemy fire arrows. Uh, cannon. It was equipped with a chionja, a heaven 
Jija Earth, Hyonja Black, and Hwanja Yellow cannons. Uh, these there's also an arquebus known as Xiangja, which is victory. The Xiangja ranged 200 meters, while the Hwangja was the lightest, but with a range of uh, 1,200 meters. A turtle ship has been reconstructed by the Gyoboxion Research Center, a private uh, commercial company. They have done extensive research on the original design and made several real-size reconstructions of them for commercial use. These were deployed in, Korea, in a Korean drama, the immortal Admiral Si Yun Sin. Several museums host turtle ships on display, and people can visit and go inside a one-to-one -one scale turtle ship that's anchored in Yosu. Huh. Sloops, there's another good name. Uh, I just found a sloop of war, which strikes me as funny. Sloops of war were great ships, very popular with pirates. Uh, Pneumatica says the Carrick was heavier craft that was used in war, still on the edge of the medieval. Basically a sloop with extra guns. Let's keep learning. Uh, sloop, Dutch from sloop, uh, in turn from French chaloup, is a sailing boat with a single mast and a fore and aft rig. Sloop is only one head sail. Uh, it might be a little small, but it sounds like there was a bigger one. Or is this... Oh, well, modern civilian connotation. Historic naval. Although the Bermuda Sloop is often described as a development of the narrower beam Jamaica Sloop. So I guess pir piratical stuff, right? Uh, raked mass, triangular sails, rooted in a tradition of Bermudan boat design dating from the early 17th century. <laughs> The naval term sloop referred to ships with different rigs and sizes varying from navy to navy. Sloop of war was more of a reference to the purpose of the craft rather than to specific size or sail plan. The Royal Navy began buying Bermuda sloops beginning with an order for three sloops of war uh, placed with Bermudan builders. They were intended to counter the menace of French privateers, which the Navy's ships of the line were ill-designed to counter. I gave you the wrong term for the anchor. It's not kedge, it's club hall. Well, I looked up kledge, and, and kledge was the same. It, it, the definition came up the same. Kavarian, hey, personal preference, schooner, cutter, or British man of war. All right, so we'll set this aside. So hang on, Sloopy. Sloopy, hang on. Carrick was a three- or four-masted ocean-going sailing ship. Single-masted. Oh, the cog. A cog is a ship type, too. Yeah. Carrick was first used for European trade from Mediterranean to the Baltic, quickly found use with newly found wealth and status in the transatlantic slave trade. So it is, it is uh, able to cross the ocean. Most advanced forms was used by Portuguese for trade along the African coast, and finally with Asia and America. Ah, okay. So here's uh, here's a plan for one. The origin of the word Carrick is usually traced back through medieval European languages to the Arabic al gurgur and from uh, thence, wow, nice nice use of thence, uh, and, uh, and from thence to Greek kerkuros, meaning approximately lighter, literally shorn tail, a possible reference to the ship's flat stern. Its attestation in Greek literature is distributed in two closely related lobes. First distribution, lobe or area associated with certain light and fast uh, merchant men. Uh, well, a carrot could be a good one. I mean, if we're going 18th century craft, just get a 74. Schooners are nice ships. 
Requires a large crew, though. Well, uh, so the the D and D basis for this is our here. We have chosen based on the characteristics of the ship we randomly generated uh, to have a warship about a hundred feet long by twenty feet wide. It can hold uh, forty crew and sixty passengers, or if we just want a hundred crew because of well, reasons, or just forty crew because the rest is cargo. Give me a 60, uh, 60 gun four mass at any day, says Kavarian. So, at least for Kedge, what you're talking about, Gareth, at least according to dictionary.com, to warp or pull a ship along by hauling on the cable of an anchor carried out from the ship and dropped. Uh, kedging to move by being kedged. Also kedge, uh, called a kedge anchor. A small anchor used in kedging. Akin to Middle English kagan or to fasten. Kavarian. Hey, that's fine. Correct me in my pronunciation. I'll do my best to remember. Kavarian. Hey, Technotron, welcome. I don't think I want a huge ship, though. It's made by dwarves. Uh, you want something that's probably middling. I mean, <laughs> dwarves are kind of middling, aren't they? They're, they're not small. They're not medium. They're just kind of in the middle. We're using the D and D unearthed arcana of ships and sea. Uh, all this week we've been making the crew, and now we've we've made the NPC captain, and we're generating a ship going through character creation steps and applying it to the the, the descriptions that we found in the unearthed arcana. Okay, so we've gone over a lot of different ones here. What what ship would we describe as as a dwarven warship? That could very well be ironclad uh, in in its current intonation. What would you like to see for the ship? Yeah, Kaverin, uh, we're we're taking our time, and this week uh, we've made the six officers and the ship. Next week, we're going to be extending this creation process and make a campaign based around it. Gareth, I know your answer. You're sticking with uh, the frigate, correct? Kavarian wants to go steam powered, a steam powered ironclad. Again, having an anachronistic, anachronistic, yeah, I think so, an anachronistic, an anachronistic ship in a fantasy setting. Do we want to monitor in a Merrimac? Uh, do we want a uh, a steam powered transatlantic, uh, a wheel boat? Uh, <laughs> if we want to stick with sailing, you know, and, and go with what's here, because look, even in this supplement. It does say elemental engines exist, like here's an airship. Movement elemental engine. Could we give it a steam engine? I don't see why not. If we're sticking with something traditional. Uh, seeing then the monitor in their Virginia, depending on who you ask. New Monica, thank you for you are you are a uh, uh, one of our history buffs here, in uh, in the chat. Going once, going twice, frigate, ironclad fig frigate. Ooh. 
right? Because uh, the life cleric can wear heavy armor. Go from there. Club hall to change tack by dropping the Lee anchor. Okay. So so it's more specifically for that for that instance then, Gareth. Doors are well known for the use of tech magic, so a steam engine is feasible. It, it could very well be Kavarian. I'm I'm not a, I'm not resisting that idea at all. Yep, Civil War era. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> I gotta go on the defensive for, for throwing some knowledge out there. <laughs> it is a popular, I mean, look, saying Monitor and Mary Mac is also just fun to say, but. <laughs> I mean, we could even argue that maybe the dwarves were the first ones to come up with, uh, with a submarine. Their first attempt at a ship sank, but it was all sealed up in metal, and so it just sort of floated under the waves. Because <laughs> that's kind of also when, you know, Ironclads and Civil War is kind of when we're getting into early style submarine designs, too. From what I recall. But hey, <laughs> I could be wrong. 